Once again, you're welcome to Wisdom uh, University. Today, we'll be looking at Chapter 6 of uh, our Network and Server Security. And uh, the chapter for today, and we use this Cisco materials, and the chapter for today is securing the local area network. How do we secure the local area network? Remember, Chapter 5, we take a look at uh, how to secure the we, in Chapter 4, we look at ACN, the firewalls and the ACN. And in Chapter 5, we look at the IDS and IPS, the intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. So that's what we looked at in Chapter 5. So in Chapter 6, we'll be looking at securing the local area network. Okay, without much ado, let's uh, begin. Now let's take a look at uh, which should be protected. In a network, what are the things that need to be protected? Uh, one, we need to secure uh, the edge devices that are connected to one. You know, the LAN is connected to one, okay? So all the edge devices, like the router, the switch, all of this thing, we need to secure them. And then we also need to secure the internal local area network, okay? We also need to secure the internal local area network. And then we also need to secure both of them, not only the edge devices that connect to the one, like the router, the access point, and so on and so forth, we also need to secure the local area network because if our local area networks are not secure, then attackers can gain access to our switches and do whatever they want to do, denial service, reconnaissance attack, and, uh, and so many other attacks that can be happen to our network, which we don't want. So in security boot, we have to secure the local, uh, local, uh, uh, the internal local area network as important as the perimeters of the entire network, which includes the routers and the access points. Now, the internal uh, local area network consists of one, the head points, like the, the switches, the access point, the routers, the non endpoint uh, local, uh, local area network devices, and the LAN infrastructure. So we're going to talk about the LAN, every infrastructure that supports the local area network. Okay? Now, securing the head points devices. A local area network connects many uh, network endpoint devices like the, the clients, okay, the devices that act as a network client, like the workstations, all the interconnectivity from the workstation, your phones, your laptops, and so many, and so many, so many other things, your desktop, your, your PDAs, and your servers, your printers, all of these are your endpoints, which needs to be connected, right? So endpoint device includes your laptop, your desktop, your IP phones, okay? your personal digital assistant, which is your PDAs, your servers, your printers, and so on and so forth. Okay, now securing non-endpoint. Non-endpoints includes a, a local area network also requires many intermediary devices to interconnect the endpoints devices together. So it needs many intermediary devices to connect all these things together, like hubs, switches, bridges, and all of these things. So network infrastructure devices includes your switches, your wireless devices, your IP telephony devices, your storage area networking, that's your SAN, SAN, the storage area networking devices, or storage area, we're going to talk about storage area uh, network solutions as we move further. So your storage area networking devices, your IP, IP telephony devices, your wireless uh, access point, your wireless devices, your switches, all of these are your network infrastructure devices, which, which needs to be secured as well. Now, securing the LAN infrastructure, uh, we, in securing LAN infrastructure, a network must also be able to mitigate specific LAN attacks. So when a network is developed or is uh, configured or is put in place, that net, such network should be able to configure or should be able to uh, prevent uh, certain attacks, uh, attacks on the network. Now, you know, when we're looking at local area network, here we'll be looking at the uh, the MAC addresses. So some of the attack that happens to a network, like the switches, you know, when we're talking about your network, we're actually talking about the switch. Switch is the main device for your local area network. Remember, the router is the gateway to the one, to the wide area network. Okay, so for your internal network, we'll be focusing on the switches, okay? So we say uh, some of the things to mitigate against attack are your, or some of the attack that normally happens to your net local area networks are the MAC address spoofing attacks. Okay, your MAC address are media access control that are uniquely assigned by manufacturers of your devices 
to your computers, okay, or, or your phone. So these MAC addresses can be spoofed because they are unique identity identifier of every device, of every device in the network. So the attackers can spoof this uh, unique address and uh, be able to do other things as it were. Now we also uh, some of the another attack on the network is the STP, that is the Spanish Tree Protocol Manipulation Attacks. The STP, which is the Spanish Tree uh, Protocol Manipulation Attack, is also one of the attacks that can happen in local area network. Another attack is the MAC address table, uh, table overflow attacks. The MAC, you know, every MAC, MAC we have MAC address uh, uh, table. Now, this MAC address can be overflowed, and this type of attack is known as the MAC address table overflow attack. Then we also have a land storm attack, you know, over storm the local area network and break and again access to the sensitive information. The another attack that can happen to a local area network is the VLAN attack. Okay? The VLAN attack is another. So we mentioned about uh, uh, about six or five different attacks that can happen to a local area network. Five different attacks that can simply and easily happen to a local area network. Now let's go to the layer two. You know, switches are layer two devices. Except switches that are acting as router that will be considered or configured as layer three devices. But generally, switches are layer two devices, right? So let's take a look at layer two security, which means we'll be talking about switches, Cisco switches. Now let's take a look at the types of attacks that are found in layer two. Well, okay. Now layer two and layer three switches are susceptible to many of the same layer three attacks as routers. So many of the attacks you find on routers, some of these attacks can also be, be targeted to the switches, can also happen to switches. So most of the security techniques for routers also applies to switches. So the, the same way we prevent uh, switches from being attacked by hackers, same techniques can also be applied for switches. However, switches also have their own unique network attacks. They have their unique, which are, which are completely different from the attacks that are found with the routers. Uh, although we said that some of the attacks are, they have similitude, okay? Switches and routers, the attacks are, have similitude. However, the, the switches, they have their own unique attacks and we're going to look at these attacks and how to, to prevent this type of attacks to our local area networks. Most of these attacks, they're from users with internet, uh, internet access to your network. So, uh, because your local area network the people who usually commit this type of attack to your networks are usually people who have your internal access, you know, people who have your password, who have access to your network, okay? They are the ones usually responsible for this type of attack to this type of network. Now, let's take a look at types of attacks on switches, okay? Which we have, have atomized them already. We said the MAC address proof is one of the attack on switches, the MAC address table overflow, is one of the att uh, attack on switches, the STP manipulation, that's the spanning tree protocol manipulation, the land storm uh, manipulations, the land storm and VLAN attack. So these five attacks happens to our local area network. Remember a MAC, a MAC is a media access control, like I said, with 48 bits. Okay, a MAC address has 48 bits and six bytes. Okay, six bytes. Okay, so these are unique uh, identifier that, that are assigned by manufacturer for every device that has been manufactured, okay? The MAC address tells us a particular device in the network that is uh, performing an operation, while the IP address tells us the area or the country where the, the such, a, a, such a, a protocol or such a transaction is taking place. Now, let's take a look at MAC address proofing. How do attackers proof uh, a MAC address and uh, Let's say we have a switch ports, port one, two, three. Okay, this switch, this is a switch, this is a switch. Okay, this switch, let's assume this switch has three ports one port here, one port here, one port. Each port connects to the to every uh, workstation or every client. Each port connects to a client, and uh, each of these clients would designate them as uh, host A, host B, and host C. Okay, so how do attacker now uh, spoof? Uh, spoof uh, the ports. For example, you see, originally the host A is is uh, connected to the port A, and host B to port two. 
host A to port 1, host B to port 2, and host C to port 3. Now, when the, when the attacker wants to spoof, it will, see, let's assume this MAC address, this attacker, this uh, workstation A is an attacker. So you see, he has uh, uh, come to designate or disguise or as uh, B and is able to access the port 2. Is also able to access port 2. It's poofy what is going on in this place, right? So when this attacker used the MAC address to spoof ports and copy sensitive packet and data, or look or have access to sensitive packet and data, such, such attack is known as a MAC address spoofing. Such attack is known as a MAC address spoofing. So you can see A, A is a HD, is a HID and taking access of others. You can see A is HID and taking access of others. You can see uh, from this one to B, uh, destination MAC A. So is assumed to be A. Is assumed, is telling everything go to A. So A has spoofed the entirety and copied everything. So this is what we call the MAC address spoofing. Now, let's take a look still on the MAC address spoofing. How to prevent MAC address spoofing? We should be able to uh, carry out what we call the mitigation techniques that we should use. Mitigation is a method to prevent this or to stop this. The technique we should use is to configure port security. So every port, we should configure or enable the security features on the port in order to prevent uh, MAC address spoofing. Okay, the MAC address table overflow attack. This is another type of attack on local area network. This is another type of attack that is inherent on local area network. An attacker wishes to sniff packets des, uh, des, destined to server A, to server A and server B. To do so, he launches MAC address flow attack, a uh, flood attack. So he's going to launch a flood attack on the MAC addresses to confuse the entire system so that it can it can sniff the packets and have access to the uh, packets. So what the attacker does is that he uses what we call the Markov to generate multiple packets. So the attacker will generate multiple multiple packets, okay, with spoofed source MAC address addresses. You know, he uh, the attacker must have spoofed the MAC addresses, and it's like he he dropped and copied and learned. The, the details from the MAC addresses, and then he used what we call the Markov to generate multiple packets with proof MAC address. Over a short period of time, the, the MAC address table will be filled up. The whole MAC, because he's flooding it, he's flooding it, he's generating a lot of uh, multiple packets to overflow the, uh, the MAC address table. So over time, he will overflow the MAC address table, and uh, uh, the table, and uh, no longer. As the table will no longer accept any new entry because the MAC address table is overfilled, uh, 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 full now. So it can no longer accept any entry. So as long as the at attack continues, the MAC address table remains full, to be full. So when, when he achieves this, when he achieves, he makes the MAC address table to be full and the MAC address can no longer take any entry. Switch start to broadcast flood packets to uh, flood packets and uh, all to all packets that it receives out every port. So it, it, will, it will be, the switch will start to broadcast uh, flood, okay, flood packets, and all packets that it receives out of every port. So the switch will start to broadcast uh, flood packet, and also every packet that it receives, it will broadcast it out. Once it does that, one, because that's what the attacker wants, once it does that, the switch is broadcasting every packet that it has received out of the port, then the switch is now behaving like a hub. And this is the goal of the attacker, to make the switch to behave like a hub and broadcast out every packet that the switch has in it from the port, every packet the switch already had. So once he's doing that, the attacker can now sniff the packet that's still for the server. The packet that was supposed to go to the server, the attacker can sniff them and have access to them. So this is what we call the MAC address table overflow attack. Okay? Now, what are the mitigation techniques to prevent MAC address table overflow attack? Both MAC, 
max spoofing and max addressable overflow attack can be mitigated by what configuring post security on there on the switch just configure the post security on the switch and then the problem will be solved or be reduced now post security can either be statically specific they can either start, uh, start, start, uh, statically that means uh, manually specific or specify the MAC address on a particular switch port or allow the switch to dynamic, dynamically learn a fixed number of MAC addresses for the switch port. The second point is the best is the best point is a better point okay because this one is time wasted the first point to statically uh, statically specify the MAC address on a particular switch port is time wasting time consuming and may not be realizable and uh, feasible as it were. Okay, so the, the second one, which allows the switch to dynamically learn a fixed number of MAC address for a switch port, is a better technique to mitigate against uh, uh, spoofing. Okay, so let's move on quickly. STP attack, because it's also an attack, a type of attack. STP is a spanning tree protocol. So STP attack, an STP attack typically involves the creation of a bogus route bridge. Okay. So the attacker will create a bogus route bridge and by declaring a smaller priority with MAC addresses. So it, it will become uh, uh, the, the route bridge, okay? It will become the route bridge. So STP, this, was the, this is what the attacker does. The, this can be accomplished using, accomplished using the available software from the internet, such as the BRO config or STP packets. Now, these, pack, these programs can be used to stimulate a bogus switch, which can forward STP BPDUs. Okay, you know, this STP BPDUs, the bridge protocol data units, okay? Once attacker can broker a BPDU, then he will gradually uh, assume the root bridge, gradually be able to assume the root bridge. And once he does that, he has taken over the decision and calculations that is happening in the switch, the switch calculation, the switch decisions the attacker has taken over. So this is what we don't want to, it to happen, okay? Now we say the method to mitigate against this includes enabling the port fast and also enabling the root guide and also enabling the BPDU guides. So these three things will help us to prevent against the STP attacks Okay, we have to prevent uh, the STP attack. We have to enable the ports fast, the root guards, and the BPDU guards. So these three things are very vital in mitigating against the STP attacks. Okay, so this is the STP attack. Like we said, this is the attacker. You can see he is a, a dangerous person who is going to have access to these switches. Now, this is the root bridge. Remember, the root bridge is the one with the lowest priority numbers. The lowest priority numbers is determined becomes the root bridge, and the root bridge is where the decisions of calculations of what is happening to switches, what is broadcasted, who is broadcasting, where is broadcasted to, which port, and thereabout. All of these calculations takes place in the root bridge. So attacker want to assume the root bridge. So what it does is that it, it, the attacker will broadcast uh, STP BPDUs of lower priorities. So it will broadcast lower priority because any STP BPDU that has lower low priority becomes a root bridge. So the attacker will assume to be the root bridge by broadcasting lower priority numbers and MAC addresses. And once that is learned, then the root bridge will automatically switch to the attacker, switch to the attackers. So the attacking host broadcasts STP configuration and topology change BPDUs to force spanning tree recalculations. He's doing this in order to be able to force the spanning tree recalculations to fall on him, not to be on this uh, root bridge, original root bridge, okay? The BPDU sent by the attacking host announced a lower bridge priority. So this guy, the attacker is announcing a lower bridge priority in an attempt to be elected. You know, once you have the lower bridge priorities, then all the uh, uh, routes, we elect all the bridge, we elect you as the root bridge. All the ports, we elect you as the root bridge, okay? So it's broadcasting a fake uh, lower priority BPDUs in order to be elected as the root bridge. Now, if the attacker is successful, 
the attacking hose becomes a root bridge. And then there's a problem. He sees a variety of frames other, otherwise that are not accessible by him originally. Because once you become the root bridge, you'll be able to see frames and packets that were not available to him in the ports, in the ports of the switches. Okay, so see, and once he does that, he, he will, you see, because once you become the root bridge, he will, this one will cut off. This one will cut off. Okay, so here we have all the privileges and be able to see data that he is not supposed to see. Now let's take a look at land, local area network land, uh, land storm attacks. The type of attack called the storm attack. A land storm occurs when the packets flood the whole land, the whole entire local area network. Attackers also do this. Okay, they flood the whole local area network with packets, creating excessive traffic, and degrading the network performance. Now, what are the possible causes to this? One of the costs. One of the possible causes of this is the. Okay, minutes. Let's take a different color. One of the possible causes of this is the error in the protocol stack implementation. When the when there is error in the implementation of the protocols, this can it will it can easily lead to land storm attack. When there is miscause misconfiguration and when the, the user is issuing a direct a DOS that's a denial of service attack when it's issuing a DOS a denial of service attack all this can can result all this can result I think we should change let's change to pick okay now broker storms can also occur on the networks okay so how do we prevent this type of attack Mitigation technique include configuring storm control. That's what we call the storm control, which we're going to describe later on. Now, another attack on local area network is called the VLAN attacks. Now, the VLAN usually have what we call the truck ports uh, pass traffic for all. Remember the truck port uh, passes traffic for all the VLAN using what we call the either the IEEE 802.1Q uh, or what we call the inter-switch link, inter-switch link. So it is that is using IEEE 802 the one q or is using what we call the inter inter-switch link. So the truck port is either using either of this of this uh, technology. Now a VLAN hoppy attack can be launched in one of these ways. Either you are introducing a rogue switch on the network with a uh, uh, with a uh, 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 DTP enabled, or you are uh, double tagging the VLAN attack by spoofing DTP messaging from the attacking host to cause the switch to enter into the trucking mode. Because when the switch goes into a trucking mode, then a VLAN attack can take place. A VLAN attack can take place. Remember, the truck port can tr uh, pass traffic for all VLAN using this. Uh, two technology we mentioned, the IEEE 802.1Q and the ETA switch link uh, encapsulation, VLAN encapsulation. So these two technologies can be used to carry out this. Now remember DTP is the dynamic trucking protocol. The DTP is the dynamic trucking protocol. Now the DTP enables trucking to access all the VLAN on the target switch. These protocols, these DTP protocols, enables Trucky to access all the VLANs, the uh, virtual local area network, on the target switch. Okay? So this is it, the Trucky. See, it's using this technology 802.1, IEEE 802.1Q, see? IEEE 802.1Q to truck, to truck uh, itself into the network. Is that okay? So Villa Hopi attack double tap uh, tagging. It uh, uh, evolves taggy transmitter frames with 802.1Q headers in order to forward the frame to the wrong VLANs. So what this one does is uh, is taggy transmitter frames that has 802.1Q headers in order to forward the, 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 the frames to wrong VLANs. Okay, so what should we do? How do we mitigate against this type of attack? Mitigation techniques include 
ensuring that the native VLAN of the truck port is different from the native VLANs of the user port. The truck port native VLAN must be different from the, that those of the other ports. See, an attacker is on a VLAN on a VLAN 10, but he sat a VLAN 20 tag into the frame. So the attacker is on a VLAN 10, but he, he will sat VLAN 20 into the frame, the packet frame, in order to disguise and have access to the entire network and copy what is not supposed to copy. So what we need to do is to, to mitigate against this, is to ensure that the, the native VLAN of the truck port is different from the native VLAN of the user port. So the truck port native VLAN must be different from that of the user, user port when we are configuring. Okay, we're going to talk about all of this when we do the configuration part. So when we're doing configuration, we ensure that the native, uh, native uh, VLAN of the truck port is different from the, the VLAN of the user port. Now, mitigating VLAN uh, hoppy attacks, you, we use a dedicated native VLAN for all the truck ports, okay, and ensure that it's separate and different from the, the user ports. We set the native VLAN on the truck port to an or use the VLAN. And then we also disable truck negotiation on all ports connected to the workstation. So all the ports connected to the workstation, we disable the truck negotiation. The truck is only for the native VLAN. Okay. Now let's go to mitigating mark spoofing and tab uh, mark table overflow attacks. Mitigation is just a way of preventing. Okay. Now. To do this, we have to configure port security, like we said earlier. Okay, we have to configure port security in order to, to uh, prevent uh, spoofing and sniffy, spoofing and sniffy, uh, sniffy of the packets. Is that okay? Port security: one MAC address are assigned to a secure port, and the port does not forward frames with source MAC addresses outside the group of the defined address that has been given to it. Now, secure source address can either be manually configured or auto-configured. That's the LAN to one. Now, port security now itself. When a MAC address differs from the list of secure addresses, the port either shut down, which is the best method, or it drops the incoming frame from a secure host. So, when the MAC address differs from the list of the secure addresses that the port already has or the port has already learned, the port either shut down automatically, like which is the best method, or till uh, it's admin administratively enabled, which is the best method, or drops the incoming uh, packet frame. This one is not so secure, okay, because sometimes it may not be able to hold the, all the packets or se uh, secure all the packets. Now, the port behave behavior depends on how it is configured to respond to a security violation. Shutdown is usually the best behavior. Now, now, let's take a look at the configuration. Enable port security. How do you enable port security to prevent spoofy and sniffy, spoofy of the MAC address and sniffy of the data packets using the MAC address table overflow? So how do we do this? We, uh, the port, we enable the port security on the switch. So to do this, we set the interface of the switch to access mode. And to set the interface to access mode, we type switch config interface hashtag. Once you put switch config interface hashtag, you put the switch in the access mode. Okay? Then you follow it with the switch port mode access. You put it here. You type switch port mode access in front here. Okay? Now, the second thing to do is to enable the port security on the interface. To do that, you also say switch config interface hashtag switch port switch port port security. So we say switch port, port security. The first one is switch port mode access. The second one is switch port, port security. So once you put these two, the first one is to protect the MAC address. The second one is to protect the MAC address table overflow attack. Okay. Now configure the parameters. To configure the parameters, we need, we, say, we always set the maximum number of secure MAC addresses for the interface. Every interface, although this is optional, but it's always good to set the maximum number of the interface. 
Okay, it's always always good to set the maximum number of the interface. Now the range is usually from one to one hundred thirty-two, but the default is one. The default number is one, but the range is from one to one to one hundred thirty-two. Now to do this, to set the number, the configure the a maximum number, we say switch config interface hashtag switch port for security maximum value so you follow this whole thing this whole thing you type it here in the interface you follow it here okay once you do that then you're able to you set the maximum number of the secure mac addresses for the interface that to enter a static secure mac address for the interface we write switch config interface hashtag switch port post security mac address so you put the MAC address, okay? Once you do this, this serve for the MAC, MAC address. Enable sticky learning on the interface. If you want to configure the sticky learning, you say switch config interface hashtag switch port port security MAC address sticky. You follow, you follow this MAC address with sticky. You put sticky in front of it, okay? So then the next is to establish the violation rules. Establish the violation rule. We have to set the violation rules to know the restrict, the shutdown, and everything when there is violation security violations. And the default is shutdown. The default violation rule that you, you, you should configure is shutdown, which is actually the best way. Shutdown is recommended rather than the protect the, the dropping frame style. The restrict option may fail because if you say restrict, drop, protect, may fail. Uh, other than uh, the load of uh, an attack when there's serious series of attack so to do this uh, is to say switch config uh, config interface hashtag switch port port security violation okay the violations protect restrict shutdown but the best one is shutdown you can follow this violation after violation you can follow it with uh, with any of these three you can choose to protect or to restrict or to shut down. But like we said, the best way is to type the shut down and follow it up with uh, uh, when to start. Okay? That when it, anytime it sees a MAC address that is not land on the MAC address table, it should shut down. The port should shut down. Okay? There are three options, protect, restrict, and shut down. But the best way is shut down option. Port AG. Port, we can set the port AG. Port security AG can be used to set the AG time for the static and dynamic secure addresses on the Mac on the ports. Now, there are two types of AG that are supported on the port. One is the absolute AG. The second one is the inactivity AG. Now, the absolute AG is the, the, the secure address on the port are deleted after the specified AG time. The, all the secure addresses will be deleted after the specified AG time that you set on your configuration mode. Now, the inactivity, the secure addresses on the port are deleted only if they are inactive for a specific AG time or for a specified AG time. So when, when the ports are inactive for a specified AG time, they, they will be deleted. Okay? So the either absolute or inactivity can be used for the port AG. So to do this, you configure this by saying switch config interface hashtag switch port port security ag you start static then we put the time static time the type you want the absolute or the inactivity here you have to choose one okay you have to choose one either absolute or inactivity okay so once we do the absolute or inactivity, we configure it, then we uh, set the port AG. Now, sample uh, port security configuration. Now, this is a sample port security configuration for a switch. So, this is a sample switch 2. Assuming this is a switch 2, we start by configuring switch 2 by saying switch 2 config hashtag uh, switch port mode access. The first is always to put it in the access mode. The second is to the switch port, port security, to put in the port security mode. 
the third is switch config uh, interface hashtag switch port port security maximum two okay then switch config interface hashtag then you you follow it with the switch port all this up to this place they are always safe switch port port security violation shutdown you put a shutdown if there is violation if there is a a MAC address or known MAC address that is detected, so it should shut down. The, the next configuration is switch, uh, switch to uh, config interface hashtag switch port port security MAC address sticky. So you introduce the sticky. Then the next one is switch to config interface hashtag switch port port security AG time 120. So AG time for this is 120. So after 120 minutes or seconds, then depend on what you designate. Then after that, it will be deleted. Okay, so if you want to do show port security command, you just type switch to hashtag show port security. Once you do that, it will display, once you type this in the command interface, it will display everything that is in that uh, uh, port for that switch. Now, MAC address notification. The MAC address notification features usually send what we call the SNM, Simple Network Message Protocol. It usually, this MAC address notification features usually sends uh, SNMP traps to the network management stations. Whenever there is a new MAC address that is added to or an old address that is deleted from the forwarding table. So whenever there is a new MAC address added to the forwarding table or an old one deleted from the forwarding table, the, a notification will be sent. We send the, a notification we send the, uh, this MAC address notification, we send this protocol, SNMP traps, to the network management station to tell that to tell it that a new MAC address has been added or has been deleted from the table. So to configure that, that notification, to configure that notification, to enable, uh, to enable this protocol to be always be sent to the network management station, the, the network administrator should be able to configure this, uh, this uh, notification uh, per perimeter by saying switch config hashtag MAC address table notification. Once you type this, then you put it in that uh, mode. Okay, now let's go to uh, mitigating STP manipulations. STPs are uh, spanning tree protocols. Now, we say there are three things to do. We've mentioned them. One of it is to uh, quickly configure the port, uh, port fast. Port fast, uh, roots guards, and uh, BPDU guards. You have to do these three things in order to safeguard the STP manipulations attack by the hackers. Now, the port fast, let's take a look at the first one, which is the port fast. Port fast causes layer two interface to transmit uh, to or to transition from the blocky state to the forwarding state, okay? The port cast causes layer two switches to transition from the blocky, you know, switches the always in the blocky state, if anything that they don't know the MAC address, they block. To transition from the blocky stage or blocky state to the forwarding state. Forwarding usually is supposed to be layer three switches or layer three devices. To a forwarding state immediately by passing, by passing the listening and the learning state that it usually goes through. So this is usually used on layer two access point ports that connects to a single workstation or servers. Okay, now configure using the spanning tree uh, port fast command. And uh, we're gonna see the command soonest. Port fast, it should only be used on access ports, port, uh, ports not uh, ports to other switches. So when you are configuring uh, port fast, it should only, the switch that is leading to access point, like this switch, should be the only one that we should configure the port fast. Port fast should not be configured between uh, switches that connect to themselves or switches that connect to your LAN, but only switches that connect to access uh, points, uh, ports.
Okay. If port fast is enabled on a port connected to another switch, there is a risk of creating the spanning tree loop. It will create what we call the spanning tree loop. It will just be looping amongst themselves. Okay, that's why it's not encouraged. Now here are some of the configuration uh, dynamics for configuring the port fast. Now one is to enable the port fast on a layer two access port and force it to enter the forwarding state immediately. Remember layer two is their blocking state. So to force it to enter the forwarding state, then we have to say switch control. If it's switch one, you say switch one, or if it's switch two, you say switch two. So depending on the switch you are configuring. So you say switch control, switch config interface, hashtag Spanish tree port fast. So once you type this in front of the, remember all these things in this uh, small uh, box, in this long box, are actually supposed to be configured in front of here. Once you put this mode, you follow it with the, this, uh, this uh, statement, Spanish tree port fast. Now, to disable port fast on layer two access port, Port fast is disabled by default. So by writing switch config interface hashtag no spanning tree port fast. Once you follow it with no spanish uh, tree port fast, by default it will be disabled when necessary. Globally enable the port fast feature on all non trucky ports. By doing that, you say switch config uh, if uh, interface hashtag spanning tree port fast default. So it will happen by default, okay? To determine if the port fast has been configured on the port, you just write switch hashtag show running config interface. It will display everything that you want to see that has been done. Now let's take a look at the BPDU guards. This is the second one. Remember the first one is to configure the port fast. If you want to prevent attack, the STP manipulation attack. You have to configure the BP, uh, the port fast, and then the BPDU guards and the root guards. Three things you need to do, okay, to prevent the the STP manipulations attack on your network or on your on your switches. Now, the BPDU guards, the feature keeps the active uh, network topology predictable, and uh, since it keeps the active network topology predictable. It protects a switched network from receiving BPDUs on ports that should not be receiving them at all. So it helps a lot. Then another thing is that it received BPDU or received BPDU might be accidental or part of the attack when you get them. So if a port configured with a port fast and BPDU guards receive a BPDU, the switch will put the port into a disabled state automatically. If a port that's configured with port fast and BPDU guards receive a BPDU, the switch will put that port into a disabled state because it's not supposed to re receive any BPDU. It will put the port in a disabled state immediately because there's an attack that is going on or coming. So BPDU guards is best deployed towards the user facing ports to prevent rogue switch network extension by the attacking host or by the attackers okay let's move fast we have a long way to go now bpdu guards uh still on bpdu that guards and uh, we say one of it is to enable the bpdu guards on all port fast enable ports and to do that you use the global configuration command to do that you just type switch config hashtag Spanning tree port fast BPDU guard default. When you type this, it goes by default uh, the BPDU guards and the port fast, okay, in the spanning tree arrangement. Okay, so when you type that, you can see the B this is the attacker. This is the STP B BPDU. So we will not be able to gain access because there is a BPDU guard enabled in this switch. There is a BPDU guard enabled and in this switch. So this attacker may not be able to broker's BPDUs. Will not be able to broker's BPDUs. Okay. Remember, it's the BPDU it uses to broker's the priority number that has a lower a lower priority of his MacBook, a lower priority, so that they will, the switches will let him as the root bridge. So 
Once he cannot send the BPD, he may not be able to broadcast his priority number to these guys or lie that he has a lower priority number so that the switches will not elect it as the root bridge. Okay? So to display STP state information, you just write switch one hashtag show spanning tree summary total. Show spanning tree summary total. Everything will be displayed. Okay, BPDU V3. Another thing that we can do is to do BPDU V3. The feature prevent interface that are in a port fast operational state from sending or receiving BPDUs. Okay, the interface still sends few BPDU at leak up bef before the switches begin to filter outbound BPDUs. Okay, now to configure the BPDU V3 on your on your on your switches, you type switch config hashtag spanning tree port fast BPDU filter default. So it's always you follow with what you want, BPDU filter, BPDU uh, guard, default. Whatever you want, you type here. Okay, you get that. So to enable BPDU filter on an interface without having to enable the port fast, you don't have to enable the port fast. Here you see yeah, this port fast was enabled here. But if you don't want to enable the port fast, you just want to uh, type, uh, do the BPDU filter on the interface. Then you type switch config interface here you must include the interface here there was no interface you just a switch config hashtag okay so if you want the bpdu filter or the interface you must type in your command line interface switch configured interface hashtag spanning tree bpdu filter enable okay so to verify the bpdu filter just do switch one hashtag show spanning tree summary to show you all the BPDU guard, to display everything you have, BPDU filters, uh, whatever you have will be displayed. Is that okay? So root guard, it, this is the third one for preventing the STP manipulation, the spanning tree protocol manipulation. The first one was the, we talked about the, the, the port fast, the first one, the first which you enable or configure the port fast. Then we also say we should enable or configure the, the BPDUs uh, guard, the, both the BPDU guard and BT, BPDU features. And then the third one is the root guard. Now root guard enforces placement of root bridges by limiting the switch ports out of which the root bridge can be negotiated. Now if the root guard enable ports receive BPDUs that are superior to those of the current root bridge, is sending, then that port is moved to the root ecosystem state. So that's the job of the root guard, to always move anything outside to ecosystem state if it's violated the, the norm. Okay? Now, to what we need to do is to, to configure the root guard, we just need to write on the command interface configuration interface, switch configure interface, hashtag spanning tree uh, guard root. Okay, once you put the guard root, then it helps us to prevent this uh, from ha happening, the attacker from having access to the switch with the root bridge. Okay. BPDU guards versus root guard. Okay, BPDU guards and root guard, they're similar, but their impacts on the network are quite or is a little bit different. BPDU guard, they disable the ports or poor BPDU reception if the port fast is enabled on the ports. Then the root guard allows the device to participate in the STP as long as the device does not try to become the root bridge. If it does not the, uh, want to be the root bridge, the root guard enables the, the device to participate in the STP. Okay. Now verify root guard. To verify the root guard, we just type uh, uh, switch one hashtag show spanning tree inconsistent port. Inconsistent port. So to verify the configured ports with root guard, use the show spanning tree consistent 
port command. So once you put inconsistent port command, it verifies the, the root guard that are available. Now configuring the storm control, you just heard the storm, right? Listen, you hear a storm. Now, this is configuring the storm control because the network can be stormed with, with useless things by the attacker. So we have to configure a storm control to prevent this, this attack on our local area network. Now, storm control, local area network storm attacks can be mitigated by using what we call the storm control to monitor the predefined suppression level thresholds that are available on the network. Okay? A rising threshold and a falling threshold can be a preset and set for the system. Storm control, they use one of those methods to measure the traffic activity that is taking place in the, on the network. Now, storm control uses one of these methods to measure traffic activity. One is the bandwidth as a percentage of the total available bandwidth on the port. The second is the traffic rate in packets per second or bit per second at which the packets are received. The third one is the traffic in packets per second for small frames. So these are the three ways the storm control use uh, or three methods to measure the traffic activity. Bandwidth, traffic rate, and tra traffic rate in packet per second, and traffic rate in packet per second for small frames. Storm control, with uh, each method, the ports blocks traffic when the predefined uh, pre uh, value or predefined rising threshold is reached or is breached. Okay, so we use the storm control interface configuration command to enable the storm control and set the threshold value for the type of traffic that we have on the system. Okay, and the, 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 for bandwidth, we always use the 0% to 100%. For 100%, it means that the no limit is uh, placed on the specific type of traffic, no limit. For 0% bandwidth, it means that all, all the traffic of that type of, uh, of that uh, port is blocked. All the traffic is block, blocked. Threshold, threshold percentages are approximations that are used in the hardware, limit, uh, used by the hardware, okay? Now let's go to configuring the storm control. What command should we type or should we write in the command line interface in order to prevent this storm, uh, storm attack on our network? Storm control is configured using the storm control command, right? Now if, if, the, trap, if the trap action is uh, configured, the switches send SNMP log messages when the storm occurs. If the shutdown is action is configured, so it's either we use the trap action or the shutdown action. If the shutdown action is configured, the port is error disabled, is a storm, okay? The no shutdown interface will always follow immediately when you configure this. So what you need to configure is to write switch config hashtag storm control, the brokers, is it the type of, uh, is it a brokers or multicast? or unicast. Then the level, which level? Low, low level, high level, BPS, which BPS? Low BPS, PPS, which PPS? Low PPS, action, shutdown or trap. So you define which of the action you want, a shutdown or a trap. So this is how we configure. If we can, if we do this, switch con configured hashtag storm control, we select whether brokers or multicast or unicast. Then we select the level, low level, the BPS, low BPS, the PPS, low PPS, PPS, low action. We select the shutdown. Then we will be, we'll be able to configure this control, storm control mechanism. So here is a sample. Say, example, we say for configuring the storm control. We say switch one, configure. Uh, interface hashtag storm control brokers. So here we select the brokers. Brokers level 75.5. We select the brokers level 75.5. Switch one configure interface 
storm control, multicast level, PPS, 2K, 1K. Switch one configure interface, hashtag, storm control, action, shutdown. Okay, you can see this, we've selected what we want and we've uh, made use of uh, it in the configuration mode, in the command line interface. So, the first one is to enable broker storm protection. Any, any broker storm will be protected. The second one is uh, enable multicast storm protection. This second one is to enable the multicast storm protection. And the third one is to specify the actions that should take place when the threshold level is reached, whether it should shut down or it's a trap. Or it should trap the, whether it should shut down, it should trap the, the uh, uh, attack. Okay, verify storm. To verify, just to type this command, switch one, sh hashtag show storm control. Once you do that, then it will display everything it has. Then, mitigate villain attacks. Now, let's go to how we mitigate against villain attacks. Uh, to mitigate against the villain attack, we use what we call villain hop. Uh, to mitigate villain hoppy attacks, we ensure that the trucky is only enabled on the port that is required for trucking. The port are uh, the port is uh, enabled only for the trucking villains. Okay, the truck uh, the ports are enabled for only the trucky villains. Okay, to mitigate the, against the double eight hundred two dot one Q encapsulation encapsulation villain attack, then the switch must look further into the frame to determine whether more than one villain tag is attached to it or not. If there is more than one villain at, uh, tag attached to it, then there is an attack coming. So the attacker has disguised and is about to sniff. So we use a dedicated native villain for all truck ports and then a different, different villain different native VLAN for the user's uh, port, okay? Now here are the mitigation uh, command that we need to do in order to mitigate against the VLAN attacks. We go to the command line interface in our configuration mode. We type configure the interface as truck link. Now to do this, we type switch config interface hashtag switch port mode truck. So we put the mode in a trucky mode. We put the mode in a trucky mode. Once we do this, then we are going to gradually go to mitigate against the villain. Now to prevent the uh, generation, uh, generation of uh, DTP frames, we type switch config interface hashtag switch port non-negotiate. Okay, non-negotiate. Then set the native VLAN on the truck to an unused VLAN. What we type, we say switch config interface hashtag switch port truck native VLAN. Then we follow with the VLAN number. Now let's go to configuring Cisco switch port analyzer. Analyzer. Configuring Cisco switch port analyzer. Now, span. What is a span? Okay, a, pa a span is a switch port analyzer. A span is a switch port analyzer. Okay, network traffic passing through the ports of VLANs can be analyzed by using the switch port analyzer. Okay, every network traffic that is passing through the ports or the VLAN will be an analyzed by the uh, network analyzer or what you call the remote span. Okay, span is not uh, required for syslog or uh, SNMP. That's the simple network message uh, protocol. Span is not uh, required. Remember span is not able to prevent the attackers, they only monitoring the malicious activity. That's what span is doing. Okay, it's just monitoring for monetary purposes, for analyzing and monetary purposes. Spark can be used to mirror traffic. And this is a, the one of the best things it's used for is to mirror traffic of one port, and we can 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 be trans, transmitted to 
other port. Okay, on the same either on the same switch or to even port on a different switch. Okay, so we say the spark can be used to mirror traffic to another port where a probe or IDS sensor is connected. Remember, IDS is a intrusion detection system. Intrusion detection system. Okay, it's usually a sensor. Either it, we have IDS sensor or IPS sensors that are used on when you hear network sen uh, network sensors or sensors network. So this we use in preventing attackers from gaining access. Advanced method, high, way higher than firewalls to prevent and higher than uh, ACNs to prevent attackers from gaining access to our system. Now, SPAN is commonly deployed when uh, an IDS is added to a network. So when we have IDS added to a network, then easily we use the SPAN. We can add the SPAN to do some job for us. Now, what jobs do, will it do? IDS devices need to read all the packets in one or more VLANs, and SPAN can be used to get the packets to the IDS devices. So the job of the SPAN is to get the packets to the IDS devices so that the IDS devices can read the, the packets. So to do this, we're going to uh, configure this in the configuration mode. A span sections can be configured to monitor source port traffic to a destination port. So by doing this, we say switch config hashtag monitor section. And then we put the section number source, interface, and so on and so forth. We're going to see the whole configuration dialog. So switch config hashtag monitor section destination. We put the interface and the encapsulation replicate ingress uh, dot one q vlans and so on and so forth. Uh, untagged all of these remote vlans so on and so forth. So whatever you configure is what is going to come out. So see an example. Switch one config hashtag no monitor session one. Switch one config hashtag monitor session one. Monitor session one source interface gigabyte Ethernet. They see they put in the port gigabyte Ethernet zero slash one. This is the port number. Uh, switch one config hashtag monitor session one destination interface gigabyte zero slash two encapsulation replicate. So this is uh, the span uh, configuration, an example of span. Okay, another example, example two is that in this example, the switch is configured to to capture the received traffic on VLAN 10 and also capture the transmitted traffic for VLAN 20. And then forward the output to interface fast Ethernet 3 slash 4. So you can see, capture the monitor the section, one source VLAN 10, that's the receive one, monitor the section one source VLAN 20, the transmit one, and then monitor session destination interface, meaning forward that to this uh, interface. Okay, this is the configuration for a span in, the, in this regard. Now, verify span. How, which command do we use to verify this span? We just type switch one config hashtag show monitor section one. Show monitor section one. Okay, to display what we have. See, they receive. They receive a VLAN 10, they transmit 20, and then destination port forward it to this uh, fast Ethernet for 3 slash 4. Okay? So, in this example, all the traffic received on VLAN 10 or transmitted from VLAN 20 is forwarded to the fast Ethernet 3 slash 4. Okay? Now, let's go to private VLAN edge. Now we say the VLAN, the private VLAN edge feature, also known as the protected ports, prevent the forwarding of traffic of the unicast, multicast, brokers between protected uh, ports. It protects and prevent the forwarding of traffic, whether it's a unicast traffic, multicast traffic, and broadcast traffic between the protected ports. Data traffic cannot be forwarded between the protected ports at layer two only. Control traffic is forwarded because these packets are processed by the CPU and, and forwarded in the software. 
All the data traffic passing between protected ports must be forwarded through layer 3 device, not layer 2. Okay, so now to configure the uh, to configure and verify the private VLAN, we write this command. Uh, switch one show hashtag show interface giga by what is this switch port. So we configure and then display whatever we have. Now let's go to layer two best practice. What are the best practice? Layer two are switches. Switches are layer two devices. Remember that switches are layer two devices. So all we will describe is this are layer two devices. Layer three are routers. Although some switch can act as layer three devices, but they will be acting as routers. They will be acting as eh, routers. But in this, uh, for this lecture, we'll be looking at layer two devices. Now, layer two best practices. One of it is to manage switches in a secure manner. You have to manage all the switches in a secure manner by installing SSH, out of band management, using ACLs, Okay, we describe HCLs in chapter four, the access control uh, links. So we describe uh, this one in chapter four. So we have to manage all the switches in secure manner by installing or configuring SSH, out of bounds management and ACL. There, which another good practice we should adopt is to set all user ports to non trucky ports. All the users are not trucky. Only the VLAN ports are trucky ports. Okay? Then, uh, use port security where possible for access port. Always install the port or enable the, configure the port security for all the access port, ports. Then use CDP only where necessary. With phones, it is very useful. Configure port fast on all the non trucky ports Configure the BPDU guards on all the non trucky ports and configure the root guard on the STP root, root ports. So these three are very important as, as well. We've described them already. And all these points, all these uh, seven or eight points, are best practices that can happen to layer two switches. Now, the VLAN security best practice, let's take a look at the best practice for VLAN. For VLAN, we disable the auto trucky or use the FACI ports. Explicitly, explicitly, we configure uh, the trucky on infrastructure port, and then we disable unused ports and put them in an unused VLAN. We, we use the distinct VLAN assignment for management for native user data, voice, black holes, and private. Okay? Now let's go to advanced technology security consideration. Now today's network or modern networks, they are more advanced than what we've been describing, right? Now let's take a look at, have an overview of an advanced network. An advanced network can converge networks, so not just a network, converge the networks. And they will have increased the increasing challenge uh, uh, from modern network design, right? So, new services to support include wireless, the VoIP, and the SANS. SANS are the storage area network solutions. Storage area network solutions. These are some of the things that are added to the previous one, what we've studied before, what we've been studying in this chapter. So, wireless has come to play, VoIP, voice over IP has come to play, uh, storage uh, access network solutions have also come to play. So in addition with what we have before. So you can see the wireless network. You have different segments. Uh, you have the wireless LAN control switch. You have the LAN. Uh, you have the, so for a wireless, you have so many things. Wireless IDP, IP features within. Here is the VoIP, VoIP network, the voice over IP networks. You can hear you'll be seeing telephony, conference call, and so on and so forth, because it goes with VoIP, uh, P, uh, PSTN, you have uh, email, voice, and so on and so forth. Here you have the SAN, uh, the SAN networks, the storage, okay, the storage. Now, wireless network, Let's take a look at the first one, which is the wireless network. Wireless deployment. First, we make it autonomous. 
Each access point must be individually configured. Individually configured. Infrastructure. Uh, we also uh, deploy infrastructure for this uh, wireless network. And this infrastructure, they are lightweight. They are not like the wired network. Uh, Modern enterprise wireless now include what are the lightweight infrastructure, lightweight AP, uh, APs, access points, wireless LAN controllers, the WLCs, the wireless LAN controllers to manage the APs. Then we have the wireless control system, wireless control system to support the wireless applications. So if you look very well, you see the wireless control systems here to control the wireless applications. All these are wireless control system, wireless control system. Okay. We have the wireless local control, local area network, that's LAN control. Light APs, these are light APs for wireless. A light APs for wireless. And these are your workstation, your laptop, your telephone, your whatever, your VoIP, your this, your mesh APs. Okay, and so on and so forth. Lightweight APs depends on the wireless LAN controllers. They depend on the wireless LAN controllers. Okay, your light APs depends on your wireless LAN controllers. These APs depend on these uh, wireless LAN controllers and their configurations. Wireless local area network controllers are responsible for system-wide wireless LAN functions such as security policies, intrusion prevention, ROF management, QoS, and uh, mobility. Wireless control systems uh, are used to help support the wireless application in the network. Wireless attack method. What are the types of attack on a wireless network? One is the reconnaissance attack. The second one is the access attack. The third one is the denial of service attack, which we have all studied before. Wireless hacking tools. What are the tools that are used for hacking into a wireless network? One is the network stumbler software. Network stumbler software is used to find wireless network. This network stumbler is to, first of all, dig out the wireless network that are available. Okay, this software helps to dig out any wireless network that, that is available. Another one is the Kismet software. The Kismet software displays wireless networks that do not broadcast their SSIDs. The s not software sniffs and cracks web keys. Web keys. The co, the co party cracks the WAP WPA PSK, which is called the WPA1. Remember, WPA1 is no longer secure. We need W WPA2. Okay. Asleep gather authentication data. All these are software to steal data or to hack. The wire sharks can scan uh, wireless Ethernet data and 802.11 SSIDs. Now let's take a look at the reconnaissance attack. Reconnaissance is the unauthorized discovery and mapping of the system, services, and the vulnerability that are available. Okay, reconnaissance is not actually an attack, big attack, but it's like you are, you are trying to map the place, you are trying to discover the place, and you are trying to discover the system, you are trying to see which vulnerability are available. Okay? It's like information gathering. It's not again, uh, entirely illegal in some countries, but it's very illegal in some other countries. A good example is called the world driving. Okay? This is world driving. These are all world driving, world driving maps. So reconnaissance, uh, commercial wireless protocol analyzer like the Aeropix, wide packets, air magnets, or sniffer wire can be used to if drop on with wireless local area networks. So these are things, some software for if dropping, air magnet, sniffer wireless, okay? But we are not saying you should go and do this, okay? Just for knowledge sake. 
free protocol analyzers like the Etheridge or TCP dump fully support wireless if droppy other liners. Utilities used to scan for wireless networks can be active or passive. Passive tools like Kismet, they transmit no information while they are detecting wireless networks. That's why they are passive. If they are active, they will transmit. Securing wire, securing the wireless. Today, today, first of all, is the default set unique SSID with brokers SSID dis, uh, disabled. In fact, the, to cut it long story short, this is the most secured system, WP, WPA2, with advanced encryption standard AES. So this WPA2 with advanced encryption standard AES is the best way to secure your wireless network nowadays. Okay? Security wireless. Some of the security considerations are wireless network using web or WPA, TKIP are not very secure nowadays. So to use a secure one, you must look for this one. WPA2 Advanced Encryption System. So this one will help to secure our system. Now VoIP networks. Let's go to VoIP networks. The sources of the VoIP, that's voice over, voice over IP. The sources in data networking has led to its ad adaptation to voice traffic. Now, voice has become popular largely because of the cost of uh, cost saving that is happening with over traditional telecommunication system. Okay, VoIP advantages. It has a lot of advantages. Uh, it uh, helps to charge up to 50% less of your telecom bills. Uh, Feature-rich environment can increase productivity. Uh, feature includes me, follow me, find me, follow me, remote office, click to call, Outlook, integration, unified voice mail, conference calling, and all these collaboration tools. Okay, so it has a lot of advantage. Uh, telecom, commuting phone are decreased. All your phone bills are decreased with VoIP. Many VoIP systems require little or no training for users. Uh, VoIP enable unified messages. Encryption of voice calls is supported using VoIP, VoIP, and so on and so forth. Many advantages. VoIP components. Here we have the co one of the go components for VoIP is the PS PSTN. It's like the gateway provides transmission between VoIP and non VoIP provide transmission be between VoIP and non-VoIP. So it's, a, it's called the VoIP gateway. The second component of a VoIP uh, system is the call agent. Usually we have the Cisco agent. It provides call control for the IP phones, call admission controls, bandwidth controls and management and access translations and so on and so forth. Then we have the IP phones, the IP phone for VoIP. It provides the IP voice to the desktop. IP voice to the desktop. Then we have the application server, the Cisco Unity. The application server provides service such as the voicemail and unified messages. Okay. We have the multipoint control unit, this MCU, multipoint control unit. It provides the real-time connectivity for the participants attend a, a, a video conference. That's what this one does. Then we have the video conference station. This place, video conference station here. It provides access for end user participation in video conferences. This station contains a video capture device for video input and microphone for audio input. Okay. VoIP security consideration. VoIP communication occurs over the traditional data network that we already have, which means that all the attacks that affect the data communication will also affect the VoIP. VoIP specific attack includes its own unique attack includes unauthorized access to voice resources, 
compromised network resources, eavesdrop, and DOS attack, denial of service attack. Okay, so you can see a VOB spam. Speed is one of this uh, spam. The Vichy, you know we have Vichy. Vichy is the voice Vichy. The voice Vichy is called Vichy. It uses telephones, telephony to glare, to glare information such as account details directly from users. Using telephony to glare information from information. For example, victim receive, victims receive an, a phishing email from PayPal asking them to verify their credit cards details over the phone. Okay? Toll fraud. Toll fraud is a theft of long distance telephone service by unauthorized access to PSTN truck. Okay, on a BPS on or voicemail system. Toll fraud is a multi billion dollar in a industry already, and all the organizations are vulnerable to this uh, toll fraud. SIP. SIP is relatively new, but increasingly becoming popular protocol that offers little inherent security. Examples of a uh, hack of SIP include registration hacking. Uh, message temporary, sexual tear down, and so on and so forth. VoIP security solutions. One of the security solutions we can do is to create a VoIP VLAN. We can also do a uh, security solution by configuring the fireworks to expect voice protocols to ensure that the SIP and the SCCP is H323 and MGCP requests conform with the voice standard. Another thing we can do is to use the IPsec VPNs using either the DS, the DES and the 3DES encryption systems. Now let's go to the SAN network. I think the almost the end of the SAN. The SAN is the storage access, uh, storage area network. The storage area network uh, usually, we say network and server downtime costs companies large sums of money in businesses and productivity losses, right? Now, at the same time, the amount of information to, to be managed and stored is increasingly uh, becoming dramatically, is increasing dramatically every year, right? So, a SAN, that's a storage area network, is a specialized network that enable fast, reliable access among servers and external storage resources in, within different networks. A storage uh, device is not the exclusive property of any one server. They are shared among other network servers as per resources, especially the cloud one. A SAN does not uh, need to be a physical separate network, okay? Now, storage area network, uh, solutions. Uh, Cisco SAN solution provide a preferred means of accessing and managing and protecting information resources across a variety of uh, SAN transport technology. For example, fiber channel, uh, fiber channel over IP, internet small computer system interface, internet small computer system interface, Giga Ethernet and optical, network, uh, optical networks. So we can have a look at each of the, there are technologies, each of these transport technology to see what is uh, going on. Now fiber channel zoning. Partitioning the fiber channel fabrics into smaller subsets is called the fiber channel zoning, like you have here. Partition them into different subnets. Okay. VSANs, the virtual storage area, a network visa is a collection of ports from a set of connected fiber channels switches that form a virtual fabrics. Originally uh, developed by Cisco, but now it's an uh, ANSI standard. Okay. 
Visas uh, strongly res re resemble the VLANs that we described earlier on. VSANs uh, utilize hardware-based isolations, meaning that the traffic is explicitly tagged across inter-switch links with Visas membership information. Okay, six critical areas for visa security. One is the sound management area. This place, the sound management. Okay, this sound management area. Here, it is secure the management services that are used to administer the, the sun, the storage area network. The fabric area, these areas are the fabric area and it helps to secure uh, to secure access to the fabrics okay then this area number three is the target security area the target access secure access to storage devices then number four is the sound protocols this protocol secure the protocol that is used in the switch to switch communication number five is the IP storage assets. It secures the FCIPs and the ISCIS. Number six is the data integrity and secrecy. It encrypts data as it crosses networks as well as when stored on the disk. Okay, so thank you for joining us in today's class.